welcome. Um, I'm slightly standing on behalf of my colleague, Abby, who's put this event together with uh, the team at ACAN. Um, but just to welcome you all from the Climate Emergency Network, which is a network of students and staff across all of UAL's colleges um, who respond creatively uh, to the climate emergency and have been a key part of um, the momentum and energy behind our Climate Action Plan. I'm going to hand over to Tom from ACAN to say a little bit about them, but thank you also to Catalina and um, Climate Forum for co-hosting. Oh, oh yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I think this is working. So, um, Yeah, good evening and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to the first of these uh, climate discourse sessions. So. Um, yeah, this is an event being held jointly by ACAN, um, Climate Forum here, Spatial Practices, and also the Climate Emergency Network across UAL. So, um, yeah, we're really grateful to them for providing this wonderful space in central London. Uh, so ACAN, for anyone who doesn't know, is a network of individuals within the built environment taking action to address the twin crisis of climate and ecological breakdown. Um, are there any ACAN coordinators here? Could you put your hand up if you're an ACAN coordinator? No. Oh, we've got one here. Um, okay, so if you want to know more about ACAN, speak to this lady here, um, or go on the website and drop us an email. So, yeah, build, the building discourse um, event that we've put together tonight is a bit of an experiment the first time we're doing this and the idea the purpose really is to um, to kind of examine contested questions that overlap the built environment and the, the climate crisis so we're really trying to to hone in on some issues where we we don't agree there might be diverging perspectives even within what we might call the environmental uh, flank of, of the industry so that's the purpose, um, and we're really trying to open a space to, to kind of critically reappraise our thinking and um, recalibrate the kind of campaigning that we're doing. So tonight is hopefully going to involve some comradely debate, um, but we're not using the sort of formal trappings of a debate format. And we do have some very eloquent speakers kindly given up their time um, to be here tonight. But it's also not really meant to be a formal panel discussion, so you're all invited to offer your contributions and participate in this this evening. Um, we do have a specific topic, though. Um, so as you offer your questions and your comments, please come back to this thought of, or this question, rather. Should there be a moratorium on new build construction in the UK? So. What is a moratorium? For the total avoidance of doubt, the definition of a moratorium is a temporary prohibition of an activity, i.e. a temporary ban on something. Um, and it could be nuanced. It could be qualified and caveated. So it doesn't need to be a kind of simplistic or absolute thing. And the final thing to say about it, obviously, a moratorium on new builds wouldn't, we would say for the purposes of tonight, that wouldn't impact on retrofit. Um, which we know is necessary. So that's a, a bit of framing for, for the discussion. Just before we start, I want to do a temperature check here in the room. Um, so I'm going to ask you whether you're um, not sure about the issue, whether you're in favor of a moratorium, or whether you're against a moratorium. Um, so if I could ask you all, if you're, if you're really not sure, if you're really like on the fence about this issue, could I ask you to raise your hands? Um, OK. If you're in favor of a moratorium, could you raise your hands? And if you think you're, you're pretty set against the idea, could you raise your hands? OK. <laughs> so it's just good, it's good to know. It's good to know, isn't it, roughly where we are in the room. Um, good luck, guys. <laughs> All right, so, so we've done that. Um, I just want to end this little bit um, reading a, a quote from a recent George Monbiot article because I'm that guy. 
Um, so if you indulge me, there are no remaining comfort zones. There, are, there is no longer, if there ever was, scope for ideological congruence, for solutions that fit snugly into any one world view. We will find ourselves in disconcerting places. We will be assailed by cognitive dissonance. In seeking to address our great predicaments, we should be, as much as is humanly possible, open-minded, open-hearted, receptive to evidence, argument, and persuasion. The answers, contradictory, incomplete, and inadequate, as they always will be, will be social, political, economic, organizational, and technological. We might not like our own conclusions. Um, so on that note, I would like to pass over to Catalina from Spatial Practices. Thank you, Tom. Great course from HAACAL, which asks, should there be a moratorium on new construction in the UK? As Climate Forum, it is a pleasure to be here hosting you all. And to give a bit of context, what, what is the Climate Forum? The Climate Forum is a research and exchange platform that sits at the core and across spatial practices and that operates through three lenses, ecological, pluivocal, and planetary, centering questions of climate across all spatial practices curriculum. The question on new construction and on stopping new build is one that has for some time already been at the heart of our teaching pedagogies and practices at Spatial Practices. Charlotte Mattel Bad provocation Stop Building has in many ways set the tone for us as it questions what it would mean for existing buildings, infrastructure, materials, unbuilt land, earth, and the labor that holds our world together but furthermore, lands this conversation pedagogically. For us, this question is not only of interest, but it is an urgent one. I strongly believe that we need to constantly reassess what architecture as a profession, as a practice, and as a discipline more broadly is, in response to the world we co-inhabit. It is not new that we are living through interconnected crises that are environmental, spatial, social, racial, and importantly, epistemological. It is also not new that architecture and building have been an instrument of colonial, neo-colonial, and settler colonial practices. So for us, the question raised tonight is an invitation to not only think through material practices and technological responses, but to think beyond these. If we are thinking of not to build, we also need to think why we build in the first place. Where, what are we building, how are we building, for whom, who are involved in these processes, under which contractual agreements and on which land. If we are thinking why not to build, we might also need to think why not to destruct, demolish or efface. If we are thinking on stop building, we can also think of what this means in terms of repair and reparations. If we are thinking on a moratorium in terms of carbon emissions, retrofit and reuse, we should engage in thinking of a moratorium in terms of means of occupation and colonization. In other words, if we are thinking of no building in response to decarbonization, we cannot do it without thinking about this invitation in terms of decolonization and what this entails for the many ongoing social crises and ills of the world and the role we play as architects and spatial practitioners in the UK today. So now um, I would like to introduce Charlotte Marterbat, who sadly cannot be here with us tonight, but who very kindly sent us a video from uh, Lausanne in response to this invitation. So Charlotte Marterbat is an architect, urban designer, and assistant professor of architectural and urban design at the Swiss Institute of Technology in Lausanne, EPFL. She will be sharing with us some other thinking about her studio, a global moratorium law construction and the framework that somehow led to it, which is an initiative and a provocation that argues a drastic change to construction protocols and necessary, the suspension of new building activity must be enforced. Hello, my name is Charlotte Mantabat. I'm an architect and urban designer and assistant professor of architecture and urban design. Um, <clears throat> I teach at the Swiss Institute of Technology, Lausanne. Um, thank you for having me today to talk about the moratorium on the construction. Um, 
So to build uh, is to destroy. Construction relies intensively on resource extraction in the space making processes um, from building a single family house, like here in this research sketch where single construction elements used uh, in that home is traced back to its original material to an entire city require in their materialization uh, mineral resources that are acquired via extraction and the reallocation and the relocation of the earth resources, uh, limestone, clays, iron ore, aluminum, aluminum diazomats, and all the processed minerals uh, that we source in the form of aggregates, uh, all these primary commodities that impact labor economy, energy and ecology. And if it's true that um, less damaging materials are emerging, still very much concrete, steel, glass, and brick that remain the most prevalently used in construction along a myriad of um, petroleum based products. So all these matters are violently extracted and then processed via energy intensive methods to become the architecture of our lives. And if we look more closely at the construction process of an average building, what we see here uh, from the top left, or top right, depending where you look, uh, you would have an oil power caterpillar that's excavating an unfit plot for new foundation uh, that upsets uh, the landscape irreversibly. And then you would have topsoil that is then removed uh, and discarded, forbidding the land from capturing carbon and destroying the habitat of vulnerable non-human life. So the soil and its living thickness, the microorganism it holds, the runoff and the runoff of water, it facilitates the microclimate and topography. All of this is permanently impacted. And the cultural and the biological memory of the land is erased. Uh, then you have energy intensive materials that are deployed for construction. So at every step, uh, human labor is necessary to extract the sand, to manufacture the precast elements, to stack uh, the bricks or to pour the concrete on site. And depending on where it is, uh, this would be executed by a super native labor force uh, that is exposed to carcinogens uh, and toxic materials and is more at risk of fatal accidents than any other sector. So once constructed, a building creates impervious surfaces that limit rainwater absorption and airflow. They continue to consume energy, with including general use and also cheap labor via maintenance. Then it's demolished at the end of an average lifespan of 40 to 60 years. And despite what the industry claims, very few parts are recycled and actually the bulk of the structure becomes de facto debris waste that actually accounts for a third of landfills worldwide. And these are only a few of the many arrangements that construction involves, none of them showing signs of deceleration. Uh, but building only accounts for one part of a much larger uh, picture design processes and construction protocols rely on an ecosystem of connected objects, uh, computers, phones, data centers, information networks, robots, uh, GPS-led machines that fuel in their dependency a host of less visible extractive processes to procure minerals and materials like gold, lead, lithium, manganese, mercury, mica, nickel, quartz, silicon, sulfur, sulfide, uranium, and zinc. And those are preponderant in the building industry, uh, these technologies that contribute massively to the politics and territorialities of resource mining expanding further the impact of the built environment within extraction capitalism. So while we're already contributing 40% of the world carbon emission in 2021, the building industry anticipates significant growth and construction materials use is actually expected to double until 2060. So the various estimates of this energy consumption break, uh, some say construction corresponds to 50% of the whole life carbon emission of the building, coming from the embodied carbon uh, at the start of the life cycle, manufacturing, transporting materials, and the construction process, as well as through maintaining and renovating the building, and also during its demolition, and the other 50% are with the use. Uh, this is a ratio that varies from one country to another, also depending on which metrics um, are used. But in any case, the uh, UN IPCC report is very clear. I quote, we're not on track to achieve a climate resilient sustainable world. Um, in March 2020, the world stopped 
and stood still. But not everything stops. Construction site kept operating very much, so with some adjustments maybe here and there. The first lesson the coronavirus has taught us is also the most astounding. We have actually proven that it is possible in a few weeks to put an economy system on hold everywhere in the world, a system that we're told was impossible to slow down and redirect. So this is a quote from a text published in March 2020 amidst the global lockdown by French philosopher Bruno Latour calling for a reset, arguing that if everything is stopped, everything can be questioned, banned, selected, sorted and interrupted for good. But as construction site kept operating, the pause offered by the pandemic to question our societal model as advocated by Latour did not happen. And this critical question about the built environment remained unaddressed. So a critique of the present state of affairs, a moratorium on new construction spells out trouble and refuses the unchecked modus operandi of an industry asleep at the wheel, articulating the promise of another future. So carving a space of resistance within design and planning fields against the unrestrained logic of profit that rely upon despoliation and exhaustion, it aims to force the collective disciplines of the built environment to confront their shortcomings and interrogate their harmful practices inside and outside of the office. So a moratorium asks, is new construction the right way ahead to house humanity in such times? Challenges the separation between design and and extraction, building, and politics. Putting the plug on architecture as simply the facilitator of productive capital, a moratorium halts the damage while taking stock. So to address the harm produced by construction, the necessity to pivot toward a non-extractive architecture is undisputed. Stop building, obviously, and here's a simulation of an unsurprising lowering of construction against the business as usual scenario where a decline of immaterial use and in carbon emissions model, but what after, what needs to be addressed from housing access to value changes um, to the industry and its extractive sources. So we seem to show how a construction freeze can be a tool to slow down the damage while building up this counter reality of a non-extractive future. Uh, the moratorium first took the form of four round tables from which I, I drew many of the ideas uh, articulated in the um, in the current stand of the of the work, so bringing to the fore many key questions. Um, for instance, discussing the, discussing the moratorium, uh, South African architect Ilse Wolf um, showed that image of a self-initiated construction, a woman building a, a mature house, the traditional house of the Nama people in South Africa, as a way to interrogate what type of construction should stop and where. And this is a key question. Uh, that it raises as one calls for a halt to building. Uh, can it be global? Uh, and before answering this question, and I think we need to take a closer look at the current discourse, uh, it suggests reduction and, and frugality are suited for industrialized extractive nation, the so-called um, geopolitical global north. But for the rest of the world, it's development and progress that is desirable. And I think... Nächste um, Halt, Solotoren. I think we need to be uh, not oblivious of the tentacular hegemony of global capital, which has deeply infiltrated economies across the world following the tracks of the colonial project via development aid, foreign investment, uh, debt economy, and the like. Uh, what uh, Olufe Mutewo articulates in an extended form of elite capture um, is in our case demonstrated by the way chronic capitalism deployed by political, social, and economic elites in the service of their own interests at the expense of the broader community exists in a built form. And we're obviously not discussing public infrastructure such as schools and hospitals here, but mostly massive residential projects. And because of these complexities, posing construction also problematize, or halting construction, problematize the narrative of progress and techno positivism and discuss the imperative for boundless economic growth preferred by post colonial powers over other nations. So, for instance, there are 12 million vacant units in Cairo, uh, grounded in locally specific conditions such as outdated uh, rent control and massive new construction by the state. Or in rural Japan, hundreds of buildings stay unoccupied. Uh, retail and office space occupancy remains low in the US, while sprawling suburbs relying on individual mobility 
endlessly consume the land. In France, social housing units built um, less than 40 years ago are left unmaintained to be torn down while debt fueled suburban homes be spent on agricultural land. In Switzerland, there is this Erzatz Neubau, the replacement system, sees the destruction of low rent units with the conditions substituted by larger dwellings not affordable to previous tenants, uh, gentrifying entire era. Or in Costa Rica, the Bill Coast new construction comprises coastal residential units aimed at tourists or expatriates, fueling socio environmental issues of displacement and degradation. So what is put under a spotlight with the moratorium is the unquestioned assertion of construction as panacea, the silver bullet, from housing to unemployment. So from the Bay Area to Mumbai, really, the construction of solution storyline is sub. Building more is heralded as the only answer, a discourse supported in most political spheres. In California, the Department of Housing and Community Development argues that 180,000 new units are needed each year to tackle housing needs. Or in Germany, build, build, build is the motto uh, of the housing crisis, as politicians promise 400,000 new units yearly. But this agonizing like motive of more conceals the reality of a flawed building activity, uh, obsolete building plans, and outdated housing regulation. And the incapacity of the sector to envision an alternative large scale housing provision scheme beyond building new uh, needs to be addressed. So stop building is, to me, an incredible, exciting brief to explore the vast potential in not building new. It allows to confront the past, the present, and the future of the built environment and to engage with the existing stock to move forward while questioning the current economic development model. And some of this work um, nourishes thought that will find their way, hopefully, in a publication uh, with Sternberg Press, hopefully by spring 2024. Uh, Nubian architect and decolonial scholar Mena Aga, who was part of the third roundtable, uh, framed the call to stop building, to start constructing, as a prerequisite to setting off the reconstruction of the re and the rehabilitation of the built environment for the racialized and gendered people that bear the brunt of it, the ecological and social devastation. Uh, while being the ones who care for our world. So a pause would allow institutional pivoting towards unbuilding reparative works and resource stewardship, remodeling our tasks as architects. So to stop building is to carve the space of denial, to deploy our organizi organizing abilities to think about new construction uh, of emancipated practice, engaging in remedial work, uh, seeking to interrogate and stop the harm architecture products, produces to instead set the care of the living as our own agenda. Thank you. Catherine, did you want to say anything else? All right, well, um, Thank you very much to Charlotte. Uh, this is being recorded, so she will watch and she will hear all of your claps. So um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, my name is Shumi. I also teach at this school at Central St. Martins alongside Catalina. Um, just want to say thank you to uh, not only Charlotte, but also um, everyone who's helped organize tonight. So Tom, Abby, Catalina, um, many others here. And also you for giving up um, your kind of November evening. Um, thanks for being here and for letting me play the um, quite fun role of vaguely emceeing. I'm not making any kind of statement for or against. I have a position. I'll share it with you later. Um, but um, so my role basically is I'll introduce the speakers just now. Um, I'll be making notes. You might have seen me already copiously making <coughs> notes. But um, I would ask that you also make notes while the speakers are speaking. You have five people speaking, five minutes each. It's rapid fire, so you won't get bored. Maybe try and make sure you have one question per speaker. What I'm saying is don't depend on me to ask the questions that you want to um, ask. So there'll be time for that later. Um, and I'm not uh, just being stern with you. Also, the speakers, I'll be um, coughing into my microphone and saying time at five minutes so that we can um, keep that space for discussion. All right. 
So um, I'll introduce the speakers in order of speaking. We're not sat in a particularly hierarchical um, way. We're just sort of distributed around this bit. Before I do that, tiny little bit of um, housekeeping. There is water down at the bottom um, of the room on a table there. Um, it does get a bit stuffy in here. So there's water in a jug with glasses, or there's evil plastic bottle water. Um, <laughs> There's plastic cup water. Yeah, we're in a school where people can do things, amazing things with plastic, but still. Um, all right, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, oh, and also put your phones on silent if you haven't already. Thank you. So um, speaking first is going to be Indy Johar, who is an architect. Co you can wave at them if you like, Indy. Um, as an architect, he's co-founder of Project Zero Zero and most recently Dark Matter Labs. He's also co-led numerous research projects, social ventures and initiatives, and taught at numerous universities from the AA to the MIT. Um, next up is going to be Joe Giddings to my left. Um, Joe Giddings is also an architect, co-founder of ACAN, and currently UK Network's lead for Built by Nature, a bio-based materials network and grant fund. Um, third, Keeping up is Jay Morton, who's an associate at Bell Phillips Architect and ran as a Labour parliamentary candidate in 2019. So, uh, much respect for that. In addition to party political activities, Jay is an active housing campaigner. After Jay is going to be Kutsai Matsui, um, who is an architectural designer, activist, and EDI specialist. She sits on the Museum of London's London Sugar and Slavery Advisory Board and is a research assistant at the Liverpool School of Architecture. And with the final word is going to be my colleague Adriana Kobokore, um, Dr. Adriana Kobokore, architect, scenographer, and educator. She's a senior lecturer in ethical practice here at um, CSM, teaching across the BA Architecture and the EMARC. She has a practice. Um, on spatial events with Cleanthus Kliaku, uh, which delivers projects based on the motto, minimum budget, maximum impact. Um, she's currently advancing research on the intersection between ethics and joy in architecture. So an appropriate closing for us, I hope. Um, OK, that's enough out of me for now. I'll be back with some questions that I have, and then I'll be hoping to marshal some questions from you after five presentations and be kicking off with Indy. Um, good evening. Um, I'm not sure there's much of a question here, to be really honest. Um, and I'm kind of being quite serious about it. So if you were to, if you want to, UK has signed up for the Paris Accord um, to, live, to live within 1.5 degrees. If you want to live within 1.5 degrees, the UK can annually afford to build 14,000 homes a year. That is it. Right, the UK UK government, every government comes in, is claiming to build 300,000 homes. We just don't have the carbon budget for it. And by the way, if we want to do retrofit, we can't do 14,000 homes. We probably don't even have the carbon budget to do the retrofit. Right. So when we really talk about this question, I don't think this is a. It's genuinely a question. It's a kind of nice illusion we can have this debate for a, for a kind of. From some, but the real question at the end of it is there's two real questions to me. One, how do you deliver spatial justice in that reality? That is the meaningful question on the table. The second question that's on the table is what would it take to start building an, a, a supply chain and the infrastructure to start building again? And that is a different question. And these are the actual questions on the table. So I put forward to you all in debate format, this is not the question. There are other questions. And then let me also kind of disparage two things. How many people here are vegan? One, come on, hands up. Two, right. So the reason why I asked that question, if you want to build, be vegan. Because one of the big problems that we've got, and basically, if you're not vegan, and I'm not fully vegan either, right? So it's not a moral story. There is no, we are all Trump, anyone that's not vegan. We're lying to ourselves. We are frankly just lying to ourselves. We're delusional about what the scale of the challenge that we're facing is. I want to make that super fucking clear, right? That's the gap. You know when we all talk about other people being hypocritical about not, that's the gap. That's the gap in our lives. And why I say that's important, everyone talks about, oh, I'm going to build a nice timber house and it's going to be all okay. No. 
The global timber supply chain industry versus concrete is 5% difference in carbon. 5% difference if you take a global timber supply chain to any form of concrete. Doesn't matter. So it makes bugger all difference. You know how much we've got to reduce carbon by? We've got to take it down 95%. So the best carbon house, embodied carbon, low carbon house is about 150 kilograms per meter squared. You've got to get down to 6.3 kilograms per meter squared. The best retrofit, 125 kilograms per meter squared of embodied carbon, takes 21 years to get to net zero. 21 years, we don't have 21 years of carbon volcano release to be able to pull back on the other side. So in order to get to a biomaterial economy, we're gonna to have to build a bioregional economy, bioregional biomaterial economy, that's gonna take time. Then we're gonna to have to have to build an industry for that biomaterial economy. And then we're gonna to have to change our food systems to be able to deal with the food systemic risks on our land use that are already in table in terms of our global food systems. Between 1.7 to 1.9 degrees, we lose one of the major global food baskets. That's coming in your lifetimes, I guarantee it. You're gonna see India last year stopped exporting rice. Uh, that is, food is going to become a geopolitical commodity. So why is food important? Food is linked to your land use. Land use, you can't actually build, move towards a biomaterial supply chain without shifting some of our food uses. Our food systems are accountable for 80% of our destruction in terms of actual uh, forest destruction, that's actually a big part of our problem. And if you look at minerals, as was rightly being said earlier, vast amounts of that is responsible for our, our losses in terms of biodiversity. We have a structured problem. It's a two-form problem. How do you deliver spatial justice? Then that becomes a second part. We've probably got a, less than a minute left. The real question is, how do we deliver spatial justice if we can't build? And that, I think, is a real hard question because then it opens up a whole bunch of questions. And remember, the most, everyone talks about circular economies, it's like teenage sex probably. Denmark, the most advanced sort of circular economy is less than 4%, right? 4%, we've gotta be closer to the 90s. We're nowhere close, it's just a lie. We're telling ourselves lies to keep perpetuating the truth. So if we wanna move from 4% to 90%, that's a massive transformation and it will take time. I'm not saying we won't build again, I'm just saying we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the right material uses, we don't have the right biases to do that, and it will take time to re-gear the industry and the supply chains to do that before we, can, before we can make that change. Spatial justice means we're gonna to have to share our built environments in radical new ways. And the, and the obligation of 20% of a building lying empty, that's sort of being used, 20% being used, typical utilization rate of buildings, that will be a fucking moral problem. Right? So if you're using, having buildings lying empty, that is a societal opportunity cost that you've removed from society on the basis of hoarding materiality. We're gonna to have to come to a different arrangement about the issues of hoarding materiality and their social purposes. We're gonna have, so, yeah, so, so I think we're gonna to have to think more radically about what that means and there's a pathway on that journey. We will build again, just not now. It will take time. We are gonna to have to build the structural changes both in terms of the supply chains and pathways towards that as well as changing actually the means of how we organize that. Thank you. All right, I hope you're noting your questions. <laughs> Over to you, Thancho. Uh, thank you. Is it working? Can you hear me? No, it's not. You have to. Is it I'll just repeat. Good pause, freeze. Uh, so I'm going to argue as to why, um, no, there should not be a moratorium on new build construction. Um, I do want to start by recognising the challenge that Indy has already alluded to, uh, the situation that we're in and where we need to get to. So again, I'm going to cite some carbon terms. I think it's all about carbon. We are at a point where atmospheric CO2 is at, at its high point this year, it was at 424 parts per million. When I was born in 1989, it was at about 350, so it's rising very fast. And it's, it's rising faster than it did at the end of the last ice age through, through natural uh, causes, actually 250 times faster than it did then. Um, so we're in a real situation, and we need to bring that number down. After we get to net zero, we need to begin kind of uh, sequestering carbon, drawing it down, and permanently removing it. So. Where we need to get to by 2050, what net zero actually means is, is under 10 kilos of CO2 per meter squared, as India has already alluded to. Um, that's a 
massive 95, 98 even percent uh, reduction on where we are. But uh, nevertheless, um, so clearly we, we can't afford to build new homes in the way that we have been doing and typically still do today. We need to radically change the way that we do that. And one of the ways that we can do that is to, um, to make them more affordable in carbon terms, but to reuse existing building stock, right? So because of this, I would encourage us to adopt quite strict policy, actually, um, curves on demolition. But I think that's a very, very different prospect, putting in place a moratorium on new build, which I actually think is a dangerous idea and one that would lead to devastating social outcomes. So I just want to briefly explain why with some statistics. Homelessness is incredibly high. 271,000 people are homeless in England today. Add to this, overcrowding in homes is a, is a really significant issue. 4% um, of households, that's 1.1 million households, are classed as overcrowded, and that's too many people living in them for the number of bedrooms that they, they have. Add to this, population growth. Um, Every year, the population in the UK goes up by 0 0.4, 0 0.5%. Net migration to the UK last year was um, 600,000. That's net migration. I think we should open our doors to as many people as possible. I would advocate for that number, that net migration number to go up as the number of climate refugees increases. We're a relatively rich country. We can afford to, to house people. So I think you begin to see a picture of real need. There's a housing crisis, and the number of long-term empty homes doesn't really come close to addressing that. We've got um, 250,000 long-term homes uh, in the UK. That's less than the number of homeless people there are. And this is a situation that's developed because of chronic underinvestment in social housing. So, so that's, that's the first negative social outcome that I foresee from a moratorium on new build would be a worsening housing crisis, more overcrowding, higher rents, higher house prices, all of which would lead to higher homelessness. But on top of this, I think there would be a very, another very bad societal outcome um, that would be even more disastrous, and that's to do with employment. So 3.1 million people in the UK are employed in the construction industry. That's 9% of our workforce, and um, implementing a, a moratorium new build construction, you're basically making a lot of people redundant uh, and disempowering a huge section of our of our workforce. So the upper estimates of how many jobs a retrofit revolution could um, create are 1.2 million. So you're, you're kind of possibly recreating jobs for a third of those people. Um, but that's if they even want to do the new, new jobs you're creating. They might be quite happy actually being a bricklayer. Um, so what do you think would happen in those circumstances? Where, where would those people turn? Where would they put their anger? Um, so those are the two societal outcomes that I think would be devastating. But actually, I want to end on a message of hope. Have I got time? 25 seconds, great. Um, I think new build can actually be an engine for positive climate outcomes. And that's what, because of what academics have called the kind of forest to building carbon pump. I want to expand that a little bit from just forest, but really what I'm talking about is the biosphere to technosphere carbon pump. Uh, and that's because of the 3S framework of bio-based materials. So the three S's are firstly substitute. You can substitute carbon intensive materials with bio-based ones, which are generally lower carbon to produce. The second S is sequester. Obviously, we all know about that from uh, um, learning about photosynthesis in school. So Plants really do just draw carbon dioxide out of the air and they, they just pump oxygen back to us and they lock that carbon in the molecular structure of cellulose. Uh, final S is store and that's where buildings come in. We can use buildings to store that carbon for the long term and we can put policy in place to make sure that where they go back into the atmosphere. So, I don't know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, well, um, well thought. I'll pass it over to Jane. Can you hear me? Is my mic on? Yeah. I've realised I hadn't actually checked it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's already been some really compelling points, and I actually, even though we're sort of slightly on opposing sides, couldn't agree more with um, Indy that actually we do have some really, really big challenges, and actually we do need to be asking other questions. And some of the challenges is 
innovation ideas you know, how, and how do we tackle the social justice issue and while the moratorium it, it sounds really really compelling I kind of want to be like yeah let's just stop but likewise if, if you know eating food agriculture also emits a ton of carbon and we're not going to just stop growing food just to see how we're going to get you know if we can do things a little bit better and I worry that with the moratorium we'll just stop and nobody will do anything because the investment will come out will come out of the economy all those all those ideas all that investment will just disappear and then where are we going to go are we going to when are we going to start building again so following from from joe i think there is a lot of it does come back down to social justice and climate change it is and actually following what tom said it is that social and environmental and economic that we need to be looking at it's a web of things to actually get to the true solution so I thought actually in making my point I'd look at the UN climate goals and I'm not going to go through all 17 but there's a few that I picked out so goal, goal 13 climate action well yeah we can we can all agree on that a moratorium would reduce carbon but maybe it's not the right answer because it would actually push through with innovation and goal one no poverty and goal eight is decent work and economic growth so as we've said loads of people employed in the construction sector a moratorium on new build would create a massive recession and cause put loads of people in in poverty not just in the construction sector following on from that we have goal nine which is um, innovation infrastructure so promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and i think the way that we're going to be able to build again as as indy was uh, was questioning it is innovation it is technology but you know, a moratorium will just decimate that. All of that investment will go elsewhere, out of the UK, and we'll just it will just be like the recession, but worse, where our construction sector shrunk by seventeen point one percent. And I feel like we never really got going. Any sort of new ideas, as our construction margins get smaller and smaller, the new ways of building, more more environmental ways of building, it just become more and more of a pipe dream, and we just go back to doing things the way that we did before. So I think. I think that's one of the key challenges that actually without that sort of continual economic activity we won't be then pushing through that innovation and ideas and then of course goal 11 is sustainable cities and communities being a housing architect my my favorite one um loads of people on housing waiting lists in london it's 250,000, and in terms of empty homes it's just 34k homes are empty and 46 is about 46k second home so that's not enough to deal with the challenge and yeah we might have some other empty homes elsewhere but we want to keep communities together and we actually also want to be building more densely where we are already populated so we can leave the other parts of the UK maybe to go wild or to grow food so we do need to be thinking about sustainable cities as well and I don't know is anyone in, in I was going to actually it's quite a provocative question but how many people in this room are homeless because actually those are the people that need to be in the room and answering that question as well um, and then so maybe answering in this point what do we do what do we need rather than a moratorium we need we need to try really really hard as an industry but also that needs to be in with government we need strong legislation to push the market into the right direction that will push innovation without stopping economic activity you know, we need to be we do need to be looking at our existing building stock and using it more um more effectively we need to respect the space that we have we need to respect materials that we have but we also need to be bringing in and pushing that infrastructure to allow us to reuse if we do demolish buildings we use parts of those materials because we have all these stumbling blocks in the way as architects that if i want to reuse a building element it's not warranted i mean that's just a that's that's a construct that's just been made by our industry without us having the way to warranty it or, or check those details so there's we just need to look at where the stumbling blocks are and then work together but we don't need to stop building to make that happen we need to keep we need to keep going and i think the way to do that i keep using this idea of a construction task force almost like we had with the vaccine task force think of what we achieved in in covid something that normally i think there was an interview with chris Whitty a while back you know before the pandemic saying well you can't do that because it'll take 10 years to get a new vaccine off the ground when we really really needed it it happened quickly and we need that same element of urgency for the construction industry and and to, to to push new ways of building ways that we might not even thought about yet but if the legislation is there to do the right thing it will push the market to start investing and researching and testing details it will be a collaboration of academia government and industry to, to make that happen at the moment they're allowed everyone's allowed to just do what they've always done before we're allowed to just keep pouring concrete 
because there's, the legislation is not in place. And going back to my point about when the economic activity slows down in the recession, because of because there was the sort of lack of lack of income and, and the sort of shrinking of the economy, it allowed the government that came that came next, the Tory government, to what we call cut the green crap. It was an excuse because because that was the way to sort of boost industry. We don't want to go down that that route. We want to keep the activity going so that we can build the homes that we need. Yep, done. And that is sort of nearly, nearly, nearly wrap up. So it is difficult. It is complicated. I feel like the moratorium is a bit too much of an easy solution, and I don't. But I don't think it is the right one. So to build, you know, the brighter future that we want to see, and um, eradicate homeless homelessness, tackle social justice, we need to just try that a little bit harder and, and, and work together to make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I hope you're still keeping notes. Um, we have next to Kutso. No? I'm not missing anyone now, am I? You yes, me? it's you. Oh. Um, I know that many people in the room are probably thinking that the idea of a moratorium on new build construction in the UK is a radical one, but I want to explore the term radical for just a second. Um, radical is defined as relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something. And it is a term often used to describe ideas that threaten the power imbalance upheld by white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. White supremacist capitalist patriarchy is a term coined by feminist, black feminist icon Bell Hooks to describe the oppressive systems that dictate our society. And in order to keep these grossly inequitable systems as the status quo, we, the majority, are made to believe that the continued over-exploitation of us and our planet to ben benefit a very small majority, minority sorry, is the only viable option. So we're programmed to see anything that disrupts these systems as affecting the fundamental nature of our being because these ideologies underpin and dictate our entire existence. I want to take us back 200 years to a point in time when people who opposed and called for an end to the transatlantic slave trade were seen as radical. A time in history when people could not fathom a world in which people who looked like me were anything other than chattel property to be bought, sold, and exploited. The end of the transatlantic slave trade did indeed rock the foundations of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, and now we all collectively look back on it as one of the most morally reprehensible events in history. What we are still failing to collectively do since its abolition is to critically question the existence of the social systems and structures that allowed slavery, because it is those very same inequitable systems driven by insatiable greed that are destroying the planet before our very eyes. In the UK, the construction industry emitted 10 million metric tons of CO2 in 2021, and this was up 12% from 2020. This was also higher than any pre-COVID emission rate since 1990. And every year we see the goalposts for our sustainable targets shifted and rewritten in a way that appeases our moral conscience whilst leaving the machine that is capitalism free to keep churning and to keep burning, and it is currently burning at the most alarming rate in human history. Whether or not you agree with the proposition, I think we can all agree on one thing, that we need to do something very radical very soon because we are at a point where the climate crisis is exactly that, a crisis. It is no longer a point of if we pass the point of no return, but when. And the built environment se sector continues to exacerbate the issues at hand. As an industry, we are responsible for roughly 27% of all carbon emissions produced in the UK. And despite the perceptions that green building materials are on the rise, the embodied carbon of cement, iron, steel, and aluminium is still responsible for an addition additional 15% of emissions annually. Every single one of us in this industry has a role to play in allowing that to be the case. And I think the main concern when looking at a moratorium is a loss of jobs. And it is true that a ban on new builds would impact the role, role of and need for architects. But as we are seeing more and more, the loss of one role often re results in the creation of several others. So if we are no longer allowing new construction, the role of the architect in the traditional sense may indeed become redundant. However, we will undoubtedly see an increase in the need for other built environment professionals. 
The architects will now need to become well-versed in retrofitting, working with heritage buildings, repurposing, and all the other climate-friendly approaches that are often ignored because new build is still a viable option. This will also have a very positive knock-on effect on architectural education. As a very recent architecture graduate, I can attest to the fact that environmentally friendly and sustainable practice is still treated as a, very much as a tick box exercise tacked onto the end of design modules for superficial purposes rather than a central design driver of design, a central driver for dry, design ideas. We are not being taught to prioritize climate concerns at an educational level. And so by the time we get to practice, it's almost too late. So what will architectural education and in turn the profession look like if we start embracing alternatives to building as a necessity rather than an option? The idea of imposing a moratorium on new build construction in the UK right now does indeed seem radical because we are, because we, sorry, phone, small text, sorry. Um, because we are at a point in history where people cannot fathom a world in which we are not constantly erecting new monuments to capitalist progress. I cannot help but wonder at what point in history will we look back at what we are doing now and understand it to be one of the most morally reprehensible things we have ever done. Climate justice is not an abstract idea that sits divorced from all, emancip all other emancipatory realities, but instead it sits at the center of so many struggles. It is racial justice, reproductive justice, it's a women's rights issue, a working class issue, and it's even disability justice. It is intrinsically linked to every other facet of social justice. So when we fight to save the planet, we are inevitably fighting to save not only ourselves, but also some of the most vulnerable groups in society. In the words of powerful, in the powerful words of black feminist revolutionary Angela Davis, we have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and we need to be doing that all the time. So when, as an industry, will we be bold enough to just stop building? Not only super powerful, but like bang on time to the Ooh. second. Well done. Um, all right. Always with the last word. Last but not least, Adri. Okay. Welcome, Adriana Curry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be level one just going through your points. So um, basically, uh, I am going to talk to you um, based on the idea that uh, I understand the future being what we already have. And what we already have is 255 billion square meters of building for the system. We build a lot. We build 5.5 billion square meters, which are added to that figure every year. And that is kind of building approximately a city the size of Paris every week. <laughs> so we are building a lot. Um, but I will start. Uh, talking to you by offering a series of conciliations rather than a provocation. And that is because I believe that in general, but now really more than ever, conciliatory and embracing words can be more constructive than dialectic positionality. So based on a critical and existential approach to architecture as a profession, um, up front, my position regarding the moratorium is that a moratorium needs to conciliate they need to post construction and that to continue to build. And this implies that the terms and the protocols for a moratorium in construction in the UK and elsewhere need to be co-designed. We are talking about industry. We are a little, little part of this industry along with a lot of other um, professionals. I, I doubt there's a, a, an engineer in the room or, 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 or uh, uh, you know, oh, oh, one. Or, 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 a, or a, a, a supplier, or, or indeed a, a, a bricklayer here. Um, so it needs to be co-designed. So moratorium, yes, but perhaps not in housing. Moratorium, yes, but until materials are available globally, which are sustainable and, and brings us to net zero. Moratorium, yes, but if mechanisms to decouple beautiful architectural design, which is what we do actually only, from social and financial exclusivity are put in place before we can restart. Uh, but mainly I want to speak as an educator, and this is where we take from what you have just said. Um, and th there's a conciliation that I want to offer to you between present and future through education. Uh, I, can, I, I can see that many of you here are 
a student of architecture. Yeah, I can see some of my students, both MBA and, 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 and um, MA levels. So for you, students of architecture, yeah? If, and you know this, if you do not propose a sound building that is ready to be newly built in your last years of education, which comply to the learning outcomes of third year MBA, second year in MA, or, 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 or you know, when you're finishing your MA, those learning outcomes comply to something that is called realization, yeah? You are very, very likely to fail your degree. Yeah? Very likely to fail your degree. Um, and so resolution and realization, yeah? are very important in terms of assessment of your education as architects. Now, this is how embedded the dependency on new build is within the profession. And this is an ethical conundrum that being here at GSM in a school of architecture, I want to pose to you. On the one hand, we are teaching and training new generations of architects mainly on how to build and how to make a living, a living ultimately through building out of building, um, and at the same time, we are here constructing and leading, wanting to lead a discourse based on the moral imperative and responsibility not to do today. So um, I just want to, to perhaps offer for now a speculative conciliation about this. Why? Because our representatives, the student representatives for third year BA, uh, did, a, did a poll and they, they, they discovered that the main concern amongst our 300 plus strong BA program uh, amongst the students is job security. This is their main concern. Yeah? So a speculative conciliation may be, could we perhaps let's stop educating and accrediting architects the way we do? Could we perhaps negotiate between present and future with ethical coherence, with some ethical coherence within education? Can we conciliate then the future and the present according to this and continue to review with more depth and more urgency the current ethics of professionalization in architecture in light of the climate crisis? Um, so that's, that's the first conciliation that I thought about. And the, now the second. Time, but I, uh, yeah. But okay, so just to ju just to mention a couple of ones, twenty seconds. Uh, it's between maintenance and innovation, a conciliation about the paradigms of architecture by which maintenance may be replacing innovation as a paradigm. And the third one is about the scale of the crisis and how can we conciliate this to the scale of the agency that we have around. In your second one, your second one. Uh, between maintenance and innovation. That's right. Thank you. Okay. That was quite a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you for your rapt attention and like total silence while each of the powerful speakers were sort of um, laying out their stall. Um, so we had two very strongly for the moratorium, two relatively strongly against the, the moratorium, and Adriana and conciliations um, and kind of moratorium with conditions, right? So again, um, see, see where you're at with that. Um, one thing that struck me during our discussion, I'm just offering a few things and I'd invite any of our speakers first to respond. Um, one thing that seems to um, be quite evident is that it's the movement of speculative capital that keeps, you know, in your mentions of construction over the COVID uh, period, for instance, um, certainly it was something that uh, Charlotte mentioned, that it's the movement of speculative capital that keeps development and construction kind of at the rate that, it, that it's at. So what arguments can be offered to kind of offset the attraction of making some money become more money. Um, that kind of leads to um, a notion of well, where do we as designers fit into this um, scene, as Adriana was saying, a very small part of the, of the conundrum. 
But um, I think somebody else mentioned, was he, he was talking about agents of capitalism. I mean, we are that, and it seems to be something that we've accepted. So um, maybe it's a bit, maybe it's a bit of a downer, but um, are we kind of bound to be agents of capitalism? Can we offer anything other um, than the movement of speculative capital through architecture? Can we imagine any ways to do that? It was one of the questions that um, kept coming to mind when we were discussing this for all of you, and I don't know if any of you want to respond to that. Responding to, my thoughts would be around um, the relationship between architecture and property. But again, I don't know if that's a design question or not. So I can just wanna... touch on that a little. I, I, I guess this is where every, every question leads to another question, or every situation leads to another situation. Because I think the main question was the UK, and and I think that's why why the moratorium is part to part of the challenge because we have a market economy. If we had maybe more dictatorship where where the state oversaw all business and you had a moratorium, then the state would, could direct capital and invest in the innovation that's needed. But with the market economy that we have, it's like we actually rely on the market to create that innovation, sometimes with the state as well, but it's more of a partnership rather than just the state doing it. And I think that's where, because of the, the capitalist system that we have in the UK, that's why the moratorium would be so challenging because everything would just stop, businesses would leave. Whereas if we had a different economy, I think, so that's the thing, every every problem creates a solution and then creates another problem that you then need another solution for. It's a big web of things. Okay. Um, thank you. Sub-question that I have maybe for a different um, session, I'll come to Indy, and I think Adriana also had a response. Yeah, it was just a different sub-question in terms of like when we're teaching architecture, should we also be teaching things to do with economic realities, but that's perhaps for a different debate. Mm -hmm. Indy, um, did you want to respond to that point as well? Yeah, but slightly... Um, Oblique, no, that's fine. Look, um, I... Uh, this is not 2004. I think we've just got to be really careful that we're thinking like we've got 20 years. We don't. That time window is well and truly gone. Like, Denmark already went over its 1.5 degrees carbon budget. Like. I'm, I cannot stress enough, like, if you look at the climate models, they're all saying we're heading towards 2.7 to 3.1 degrees under current policy. That's global average. That means land is about 5 degrees. That means urban environments are 8 degrees. Now, if you talk to security people, and some of the security people, they'll say, well, 2.7 to 3.1 is a conservative estimate for where we're headed. It's a conservative estimate. We are just not in Kansas anymore. Like, I think we're thinking it's like a normal moment. It's not. Like, and I, and I, and I think we have to viscerally understand when, you know, I was at the Labour Party conference and I said, look, we don't have the numbers. I said, but we've got to do social justice. And I was like, yeah, but just be very careful in mind that, that theory of local social justice is, is built on the basis of global social injustice. We will kill people. Look at the numbers that are on the table of we basically lose habitable human niche zones around the world by, tw by 2070 on the basis of between 2 degrees and 2.5 degrees. We lose vast amounts of human habitable zones. So I, 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 I suppose I just want to make sure we're viscerally in the kind of the, the, the nature of the conversation. Like it is a different conversation. It isn't, we are not in 2004 when we're talking about let's have a nice environmental building. It just isn't that world anymore. The numbers are different. Thank you. Um, Andre, did you have something? Okay, we all have responses sure. on this. Great. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah. on. Okay. I, th I think you're absolutely right to, to, to raise that. I think for me, it's really simple what we need to stop doing. And um, new build is, is tangential to, I think, what we actually really need to stop doing, which is burning fossil fuels. And the reason that we think of new build as being so bad is because most of the materials that we use in new build construction require uh, vast amounts of fossil fuels to be burned. So, I mean, three materials, I think it was raised earlier, concrete, steel, aluminium. Those alone uh, are responsible for 23% of our global emissions. So that's both buildings and 
anything else is easy to do in aluminium as well in infrastructure. But, but that's just three materials, and that's that's twenty. That's a quarter of all of our emissions uh, globally. So, so I, I think you're absolutely right. We need to radically change what we do now, not in the next twenty-seven years. We need we need to do it right now. But it's really what we should be focusing on is, is fossil fuels, I think, and, and not burning. Okay. I think I think I had you've had a, okay. a point to make for a while, and that will come oh, to you. I have, I have this thing. Is it working? Yes. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, I, I I appreciate your call to stay on topic. Yeah. Um, however, the 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 capitalism is a problem. We <laughs> 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 just call it. You know? that. Uh, why? And, and let me just let, let me just uh, uh, stop here a, a moment. Say we did a moratorium. Then we start building again. As architects, and I want to, to bang on this, in 2017, 6% of new homes involved or were designed by architects. The other 94%? Oh, right? Architects. Yeah? Little. And uh, that, that means that the day before that is 200,000 homes when no involvement of architects were, was needed. Okay, so so it is a small, but it's still there. So we come back to building with all your new technology. Yeah, with all your new technology, <laughs> yes. we come back to building. But because capitalism is a problem, how do we solve the conundrum of beautiful architectural design comes into an, a holistic idea of housing that is not based on the financialization of housing, i.e. not house is a financial asset, and everything that is around the house is a financial asset. And then the whole place gets gentrified, and then people are priced out, and then we sustain this social injustice in a city like London, in a country like the UK. How can we get out of being agents of that very system? I don't have the answer to that, because I see the urgency, I feel the urgency in my heart, but the system is absolutely beyond anything that we can do. Radicalism, is it, 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 because you were talking about radicalism for a while, and yes, Charlotte speaks about all the buildings that are sitting there empty while people are homeless, etc. Let's really be radical on this one with housing. Yeah? So, for 40 square meters per person in Europe is the average that we need in our homes. 20 meters, that is half of that, uh, say across a a Asia, average, uh, is 60 square meters in the, in, in the US. Uh, we can say, yes, let's put people to dwell in empty houses. What if some of us who live in houses that are average, you know, 45, 7, 70 square meters per person, house people in our house. So we all, average in the world, live with 20 square meters. Would we do that? Do you like that? You know, climate change is the reality that overrides everything else. Would you put another three families in your house because you have the space? Actually, may I pass it to yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I think a lot of what I want to say kind of maybe touches on that stuff as well, because I think when it comes to um, ideas of divorcing ourselves from capitalism and not being agents to this system, I think this is where we need to go back to ideas of decolonization, because yeah. capitalism sits at the centre of colonial practices. So if we can divorce, divorce ourselves from these ideas, then we're moving towards this this reality that we're making sound like isn't a possible thing, but I think in the West we're very arrogant because i think we're trying to create realities that already exist a lot in the global south there are communities that all the ideas that we have about divorcing our housing from capitalism and community building and shared living they exist in the global south and there are examples of these things that exist in the global south but because we are so centered around capitalist practice we cannot imagine a world in which we're not building to 
outdo America or building to outdo Dubai and your tower has to be taller than this and your glass has to be... We can't imagine that reality because we are so centred in capitalism. So I think a big part of what we need to do is go back to these ideas of decolonizing our way of thinking because our, our ways of thinking are so intrinsically tied to the way to, to the capitalist ideas that we are being fed um, left, right and center in the global, in, in the West. Um, so I really do think that sometimes we do overcomplicate it in, in the sense of we, we are trying to come up with solutions to things that there are tangible solutions around the world. But I think a lot of the time our Western arrogance stops us from thinking that those things are viable solutions because we see them as primitive or less evolved. But actually, really, what we need to be doing is moving back to those ideas because if you look at the way that they're living compared to how we're living, who's more responsible for the issues that we're talking about now? It's us in the West, not those communities and those people. I, I'm going to take that as a note to, to throw it open, also, but also just to reflect on that. Oh, look, hands popping up. Brilliant. Just, just give me a second. Um, just um, reflecting on the period after the murder of George Floyd over 2020, when I would hold lots of space with my students to discuss how we move forward from here, what opportunities there were to shift the paradigm, to change the curriculum and so on. And although this isn't a perfect parallel, I do believe, um, as many have said, that decolonization, decarbonization cannot be disconnected. Right? So in these conversations with students, um, we put on the table, well, maybe we should spend a few years, a few a period of time in education focusing on indigenous methods, perhaps um, much more sustainable methods, much less, um, much less globalized or let's say let, much less lucrative methods of practicing architecture, which of course, you know, the, the huge irony of sitting in the LVMH lecture hall in a school where people are coming in order to gain specifically the stamp that will help them to, to earn more money, to make more profits. I mean, there's this sort of ideological conundrum that we're all sort of ignoring in this, in this room. But um, of course, and to echo uh, Adri earlier, the concern for the students is, well, how am I gonna get out of debt first? Um, so in terms of thinking about how we change our attitudes with what our life purpose is and how we manage to have liberated futures ourselves, I think these things are really connected. Okay, hopefully enough time for people to gather their questions. There's arms waving. Let's take one. Like me because mine falls on what you said. Yeah. So I hate the way that people talk about climate refugees because they're like some fucking unicorn that has no name, no face, no backstory. It's just some invisible creature that has no idea what the fuck happened, right? Where that was the term climate refugees, if anyone didn't catch that. Oh, climate The term refugees. climate refugees. Yeah, climate refugees. It's like some unicorn that people don't actually have a face or name to. And I'm like, no, they're real people. And I'm just like thinking, like, everybody's like saying, like, bringing up the, like, social problems. I'm like, nah, man, like, think about it. I'm thinking from Indy's perspective. You're just delaying the inevitable by not doing it now. The same shit that you're saying about all the people losing their jobs, all this stuff, they're gonna lose their lives, let alone their jobs, right? Like, they're gonna do that first. So, also, think about, oh, you wanna house, oh, I'm a wealthy country, I wanna house these fucking, women. where do you think they came from? You know? These are, when we're, we're thinking about this issue of putting a moratorium in the UK as if carbon is hyper low, it's absolutely not. The issue, the, what we're doing is mitigating the impact that these global powers who are producing a majority of the emissions and these global issues and creating refugees. And by the way, it's not the first time they've fucking created refugees. They're doing this every day for varieties of issues. So can you take a hit for once as a wealthy European country? Take the fucking hit. Because we, as people okay. from the post-colonial, from, from the colonized, have done this for you. You know? So I don't care. Do it. I don't care how about Western comfort. Okay, you can applaud or not applaud as 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 you wish. <laughs> and I will remind people again that there is water people at the <laughs> side of the table. Okay, can you stick your hands up if you want a question? Sorry, There's I'm one back me. here. Let me just let me just pick a few. Could you put your hands up again and then let me make this a little bit easier for the person with the microphone? There's one up there, there's one down here, and there's two in the front row. So let's deal with the one up there first. Get a second. Then we'll come to you. 
and then we'll come see you guys in the front row. Yes, I see, okay. Sorry, I'm not trying to give you a workout, promise. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I think I'll try to be quick. I think the the question, rather than should there be a maternity, is what sh what should we do instead of building new buildings? Because you know I totally get Adrian's uh, provocation about you know should we have such a big houses? So should we all have less? Because if we stop building new build and say we just refurbish existing building, we start using empty building, not just empty houses, empty offices, empty factories, empty everything to build houses, but we expect to have 100 square meters each, then we still have a problem. So should we just change, you know, radical problems like the current crisis, social crisis, and climate crisis, etc., that we have, requires radical solutions. So stop building is one, but what do we do instead? Okay, let me just hold on to that question that anybody on the panel could address. What should we do instead? Did you have your hand up at the back uh, earlier? No, okay. You did. Let's take that question as well. So, I don't know who wants to respond to the first one. Just hold on one second. Yeah. Hi. Um, is this working? Yeah. Yep. It is. Just keep speaking into it. Okay, great. Um, sorry, just uh, before I get to my actual question, just to address the second speaker, um, we don't need more funding necessarily in social housing, especially with councils. We need them to stop defrauding the councils and wasting the money. I've been there, for, I was in the council for two years in major works. The amount of fraud and wasted funds is unbelievable. We probably went about 30% of my budget, which was 20 million, which was devastating to see. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to see any more money going to those people until they're all fired. Um, <laughs> so uh, to Indy, though, um, as someone who works in the industry um, and has for a while, I don't know where to find this information that you're telling me now. So this is all fascinating. Um, but as a person who is looking at buying materials, writing employer requirements um, so we can actually tell our contractors what to use, where do I find this information? Um, is that something that you want to respond to? There's two. Yeah. Do you want to start with that? Well, let's start with that that one d directly at you, and then we can pass it around and come back to what can we do. Um, there's two things I just want to pick up. I, I I respect what you're saying about radical. I think I like the root of radical, but I would say nothing I'm saying is radical. What I'm saying is commensurate. Commensurate to the problem. Let's stop making this a radical conversation. It's not. It's a commensurate problem. We need to depoliticize it and talk about commensurate landscapes. That's one thing I just wanted to pull up because I think there's a different problem. About the fact, I think it's a real, really big problem right now. So words like climate change often are used, right? Not climate change, we're in the middle of climate breakdown. The reason why climate change was lobbied for in the US, was very heavily lobbied for, was to construct a political narrative. We're in climate breakdown. Climate breakdown means the loss of predictability of our weather systems. Loss of predictability means loss of insurability. Loss of insurability means the loss of capital markets. I don't give a shit about capital markets. I've sat in front of governors of national banks. They all recognize we're about to see a major catastrophic event in terms of capital markets. I think we're talking about capital. I think what we should be talking about is theories of property and theories of labor. That is the tools of capitalism, the coding of capital, which I really want to bring up. Reimagine a world beyond property. Reimagine a world beyond the theory of labor. Labor is effectively the enslavement of humanity to the instruction of power. Right? Imagine that. That's what we're talking about when we talk about post capitalism. Sometimes we use language which isn't precise enough to actually talk about the fucking problem on the table. There is an issue that I don't think we are accurately talking about, like the numbers that, that was being sent by Joe. People don't often talk about 6.3 kilograms per meter squared, right? That's the carbon budget. When you look at that, you can't even bloody build a hemp building with 6.3 kilograms of carbon, because actually our logistics supply chains are actually carbonized. It will take us time to rebuild the logistics supply chain. There is a real literacy problem as to the nature of the crisis, the nature of the numbers, and the nature of the reality that we're facing. 
I don't know what to say about that. All I do know is that when you do the work and you look at the numbers, you look at the IPCC stuff, it's all there, it's mm -hmm. visible, but we're not narrating it because I don't think it's convenient narration. So we're uh, not being narrating it, sorry. That's all right, let me throw it to Joe. I feel like you might have some more to give in terms of material, um, yeah, yeah material I think, I think realities. There was, a, there was a question in there about where to go for information about material. Um, which, uh, which is, you're right, a lot of people don't know about that, but basically most producers of materials create what's called an EPD, which is an Environmental Product Declaration. Um, there are more and more of those out there, and there are databases that ga gather those. So as a material specifier, um, as an architect, you can get on the phone and ask the producer, the manufacturer, and ask them for an EPD. Um, five times out of ten, they'll probably have an EPD, and that, that's going to increase. Then you need to learn how to decipher that. There's a load of information in there. One of the factors in there is called global warming potential, uh, and that's the amount of carbon dioxide or equivalent that is created through through the creation of that, that material. So you look for EPDs, basically. I mean, some of the numbers numbers that we're talking about here as well are coming from the um, science-based target initiative, which is um, basically what they did was... Uh, look at how much of a carbon budget we have as a global population, and then they divvied it up between geographies and sectors, and that's how they arrived at this figure 6.3, which is for new build in, in 2050, because you can just calculate from the, the overall budget that we have. So I hope that helps in some ways. I think one thing that we could do as a, as a school or as a group of people who are interested in exchanging knowledge is start to gather some helpful information so that everybody doesn't have to labor and I'm sure there are lots of initiatives that already do that but maybe that's something we can gather after this event good sir yeah go ahead did you also have a point to make today or were you... go ahead Mine isn't really a point it's more a clarification because uh -huh. as an activist I think language is very important so I just wanted to clarify that the term radical I I it's not yeah so it's um I don't use radical in the sense of being something extreme when I say radical I mean anything that challenges the dominant systems of cap white supremacist capitalist patriarchy which is exactly what we're talking about here so I think that the term radical should be applied to what we're talking about but I think people need to take away the kind of connotations of something that's extreme and something that because nothing that we're talking about like you're saying is radical we, these are things that we should be doing and are very kind of it's imperative that we act on these um so yeah for, for me it's just a, a kind of of language, um, with why I use the term radical. T taking it away from politics, and we, what we're not doing is, t I think it's what XR always say, tell the truth, and I think, like you say, that's not what's not what we're doing. And actually, maybe we do start to t tell the truth in, in, and see the numbers in, in a better way, and really sort of encourage that. I keep sort of talking about collaboration because I think that's the only way we're going to get out of. Out of, the, mm -hmm. out of the challenge that we're in, and, and, and with that, some, some strong legislation. And, and on that, talking about fossil fuels, what, what completely amazes me, if I had a business and I constructed stuff and I just dumped stuff on the street, I would be fined, I could go to prison. If I have a massive global business that dumps shit in the air, mm -hmm. nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, if you just legislated that, it would have been, if we'd have done this 10 years ago, it would be, I think there was a guy from Oxford University talking about it. It would be incredible how they would, funnily enough, all of a sudden come up with the technology to sort it out if they had to pay for it. But they don't, and I think that is completely incredible. Okay, so in the interest of keeping things moving, I think there were several things that we can do. We can educate ourselves around materials, we can legislate, and we can um, think about metrics that are about commensurate responses rather than... Um, anything that seems to be too scary to approach. Um, okay, there are two questions down here, I know, and there's somebody with a mic, and there's another question back here. So, again, I'm going to take the questions here. We'll have a minute, and then we'll end back here. Yeah, I think the question might be half answered. Okay, go ahead. Last time around, but it was, it's been very well articulated, the problem that capitalism is causing us within the industry. It's also been well articulated how difficult step outside of that room. If we were sat here in the 60s or 70s, or even my residual memory of the 80s, okay. at least on the table would be the idea of overthrowing capitalism. And I imagine the process of breach of the events in the 70s would go into more detail. That's, I mean, I just sound like fucking crusty old Marxist, but... I know, like, I've got a lot of faith in that way to do it for my whole career.
I know. I just think what, what Catalyst said is going to be fine. But it is not fine, is it? And at some point, I would love it to be organic and collaborative, and we're all doing this great together, or Catalyst from the liberal thing is a fucking great idea. Mm -hmm. But I just don't see it. I don't see it happening. And some, and yeah, yeah, some people maybe need to get more out of it. <laughs> like we've seen just a lot, but no, maybe there's just a did, did you have a point to make as well? Yeah, I feel like. Mine might be more a comment than a question, but I think it jumps in well because there is a whole different movement that is actually working in that direction and, and embracing that. But I think um, I wanted to link to the point uh, related to whether a moratorium is actually also a matter of justice. So um, when we talk about this moratorium, it touches the questions, the notion of property, of space per person, of the market and a feeling for whom. Because one point was like overcrowding. Sure, but overcrowding changes massively across tenors. So who is actually overcrowded overcrowded? We're talking about building new buildings, but again building for whom? Most of the buildings are demolished or social housing most of the time. And they're not rebuilt uh, afterwards in the numbers that, that we wish. So and also this question of stopping what, what is the role of the architect etc counter projects are projects reimagining different types of of uh of navigating issues is also a project urban mining is also a project and that's the one last point regarding capitalism which i totally agree it seems like we're not questioning really the roots of the problem the great acceleration that is called the capitalist scene started in the 1950s it's just 70 years. How's that possible that we cannot question something that has started accelerating for 70 years? And so that's when we put that counter perspective, maybe it's a bit easier to think that we should maybe be able to question that. I agree with you. There are quite a few things that have been instituted in the last 100 years that we should be able to question, right? But um, there was a microphone, uh, sorry, there was a question back here, right? So could I just pass that over? Let me grab it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, thank Hello, you. Hello everyone, um, thank you for the speeches, it's been quite an interesting discussion. Um, I just want to start with the clarification, so um, coming back to the point of should there be a moratorium on new build, I think it would be worth clarifying what you mean by new build in this context, because oh. the associated justice and morality has sort of knock on effect, are you talking about just new build residential, new build commercial, I'm assuming the morality with new built commercial is not as much of an issue. Um, that was what the first part. And a second uh, question uh, that I had in mind was around um, the points that Indy made around the urgency that this is in 2004, that um, we need to go, we need to start actually developing bio economies and bio regional economies, if I'm correct. Um, uh, I'm very interested in this idea personally, in my practice as well, and I'm just wondering, coming time back to the education piece that you mentioned, do is that this the wrong profession for that? Like, is architecture obsolete to help develop bio perennial questions? It's a perennial anxiety, isn't it? <laughs> Does anyone want to take that on? Me? Um, can I? answer those two. I have no idea how to answer that. But. <laughs> sure. Uh, because I wanted to go back to what you were saying about what can we do instead um, and, and what you guys were saying about this idea of like feeling helpless or how it really is this radical thing that needs to happen. Um, and, and I think it, in two ways, I think in education and in the profession, we need to be a bit bolder and not be scared to be a bit bolder. So in education, one thing that I think, when I was doing my master's, we wanted to propose not building anything because we saw it as a climate-friendly solution um, and what we were looking at didn't really have a built solution, but we were told, you have to, like you were saying, sure, you, have, you, to, you, have, to, you have to have a building or you'll fail. No, no degree. <laughs> okay? so, no degree, we have to fail. But... Maybe not in here, but it is true. But if the idea is... <laughs> sorry, it's, it's, it's so a if the idea... Right. But I think let's just say that if you're, if you're proposing something, a design in a design school that doesn't demonstrate design techniques, 
most of which are refined in a particular way and to favor particular materials. If you don't demonstrate a knowledge of those techniques, then you'll fail. Right. Yeah, so the, that, that's what I'm trying to say is, I think if, if as students, we all came together and we decided that actually we're all not gonna propose a building, they can't fail the entire year because that's an <laughs> My ideas around um, uh, are around um, reclaiming our power as individuals and as groups, because if all the students decided to present ideas that were non-built solutions um, in, let's say, just this school alone, they cannot fail the whole year. So they would have to start rethinking the way that they look at their curriculum and the way that they look at the way they teach us and the way that uh, they award and accredit us. So I think there are ways that, especially as students, the ones who are coming through these crises, you can really reclaim your power and start to challenge the way that you're being taught and start to challenge the, and start to present ways that you want to be taught and force your educators to start coming up with alternatives because I think that really also is the root of it in architecture is that we're taught that built solutions are always the solutions and it's quite hard to get out of that thinking which is why a lot of us are now sat here kind of very scared at the idea that building is no longer going to be you know an option so I think at the educational well, level there really can be a sort of collective movement to start to challenge the way our educators are educating us and I think if more of us were not scared to maybe get a lower grade because we're standing up for something that we really believe in that could have a much more powerful impact um, rather than us waiting for them to do something. And like Indy saying, it really is not the case where we have the time to wait anymore. So are we prepared to take the steps as collectives who do have a lot of power to start to challenge the systems that are just being kind of dictated to us? So thank you very much. I mean, as a teacher, I would say, yes, absolutely bring it, but I can't guarantee your employment afterwards. And I don't want to guarantee your employment afterwards, but I know, but I know that it's, yeah, architecture is a funny profession that has tied itself in, in many loops. And if what you're concerned about is employability, then however radical your school are, is, it, you know, it's gonna depend on that. We had a unqualified course for this time, for a while at this school, and it wasn't as popular as when it comes with that stamp of, you know how to do the damage. Right, so, um, do we become obsolete? I don't think we do become obsolete. We are trained to be problem solvers. There's gonna be so many problems that are coming our way in terms of building in resilience, retrofitting our spaces. You know, there's gonna be a lot of, we solve problems spatially, whether we build or not. And I think there is still a role for architects in that, in that way. Please, Andy. Yeah. yeah. Look, this employability thing is a red herring. It really is. Like, architects are synthesizers of in the face of complex problems. That's your fucking core capability. It's not building buildings. It's the ability to synthesize in the face of complex problems. That is what you managers can only manage situations. Designers construct and synthesize in the face of complex problems. That's your core capability. I do not build buildings. Dark Matter Labs does not build buildings, right? Like, honestly, you will not have an employment problem. This is bullshit. In fact, you've got to, you'll have a better life, frankly, than the <laughs> shitty life that you're currently living right now. I guarantee you that, and you'll be morally better. Right? So, like, seriously, that, those numbers don't work. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just want to add to that. I don't build buildings either. 20 years ago, I decided. Thank you. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, but, but there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of things to to, to say there. Um, the the thing is that very few architects after Thatcher were employed in the public sector. Very very few. Not citing Thatcher as an architect. Yeah. So so it, it's after Thatcher's government in decline, right? So, 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 and I have the statistics somewhere in my notes, but uh, anyway, we are running out short of time. Now, there's, there's practices like Ben Williams, which is public practice that tackled exactly that problem. Um, but there is a system of professional understanding, for example, in Sweden, and, and I want to get back to you, Jay, right, uh, with, with the political question, because they don't have the, the, the Swedish Architectural uh, Institute, like the RBA or the, or the American so. one, is not, is a, not a fraternal institute. They are union. And the head of the union has a seat in parliament. 
And when they are disclosing law, they architects and architects builders can, can call themselves architects in, in, in Swedish. So it is not licensure, it's, it's like competence um, uh, accreditation. Yeah. They have a voice, and, and I wish you would have win your bid because I mean I think this is this political this political route is what is not that we are obsolete is that we don't have a say when the political decisions are being made as architects right so I wanted to say that and I, uh, and, and I wanted to uh, because there was a question about what do we do what what you were talking about I mean there's 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 um there's some fundamental principles for for for, for to, uh, which is efficiency, uh, circularity, and there's the sufficiency principle that I think is really important. And the sufficiency principle is about reducing the overall level of consumption to what is enough for everyone. Andre, I'm just going to take a few final points, if that's okay. Antoinette, did you have something that you wanted to say to yeah, pick up on? Go ahead, anyway. And I forgot. Okay, no worries, no worries. No worries. <laughs> I think um, there is a hand at the back. Sure. It's totally, totally true. We need, as a profession and as, a, as an industry, the construction industry needs to have more voice in Parliament. I think there is a real problem that government, I think it's a bit like, you know, when they're a bit scared of the mechanic, and a bit scared of the builder, they don't understand it. And I think this is why there isn't that legislation in place. This is how we ended up with poor, poor regulations and deregulation in terms of part, part B. So I think there is definitely a push and I would like more architects to try and get involved into politics because there is a voice that's needed to be had at the table. Yeah, yeah. and just to kind of um, rebalance, could I ask for somebody to take a microphone up until that corner? Oh, you've got one there, brilliant. Um, I think there was something that came in from social media um, in relation to this event that said, I was thinking about this all morning, maybe we need to separate the protection of the title architect and those who practice, maybe that would be a way to practically resolve this. And then there are other comments about universal income uh, and so on. Um, just to think about architects who are working in politics, um, Finn Williams actually is now city architect of Malmö in Sweden, so he's actually gone back to a system that has a place for him. And the person that runs public practice is, um, is Buja Agrawal, who, yeah, as a woman of colour, I couldn't leave her unsighted. So can um, we just, yeah, take one more question from there? Yeah, hi, thank you so much um, for your different perspectives. It's been very, very interesting to sit in on. I just, something that struck me as sort of the conversation has developed in different directions is that I feel like even the question itself about should there be a moratorium in the UK and the difference between different types of new construction, which I think the master and residential, it feels like there's a tendency, perhaps when it comes to climate crisis especially, is to speak within our pre-existing systems about a system that doesn't exist yet. Well, like, yeah. India's right, we don't have the time. We will be thrust into unknown situations with new mm -hmm. socio-political spaces, with new causes for injustice and movement and time and space. And sometimes, as we head into these spaces, it's so easy to just lose hope and go, okay, well, people are going to keep building because there's money and capitalism and it fucking sucks. Um, and I'm really interested in, like, as we head into those unknown spaces, um, not only is there such potential for fallout and horrible, horrible situations, but there's also such potential for change. As the first speaker was talking about how coronavirus was an example of that, these systems that we were told were absolutely steadfast and unshakable have now were, were changed and completely upturned the way that we existed mm -hmm. together. And we can talk about, oh, we can change our social situations the way we think about living in community. But I'm curious for each of you as practitioners and as educators, how we think about going forward, maintaining a sense of hope in practice and trying not to get tied up in the maybe very specific weeds of like, oh, well, if it's legislated, then it goes through the government, which is a system that isn't great for everyone, which then triggers down to builders who may not carry out those things. Like, we know the systems, but how do we face it forward, envision a sense of change in a hopeful space? Well, I guess that's part of what, we, what we're trying to do here. 
and in the school in general. Does anyone want to respond to how uh, things might be taken on at a practice scale? Or I would encourage us to also continue this conversation in the bar. Uh, look, I, I don't sit with hopefulness. I, the reason why I'm telling you the story as I understand it is not to talk, not, it's not without hope, it's to embrace the darkness so that we can actually talk about a real light. Like, I worry that we talk about delusional lights, delusional possibilities, which are actually never going to be fulfilled and we'll self terminate ourselves. So, when we sort of talk about this, we don't talk about it with an implication that this is the end. I actually think we're on the cusp of an extraordinary story. So, if you look in New Zealand, where rivers are being made self sovereign or mountains are being made self sovereign, we're That's imagining a new, and I think there's an alternative between capitalism and Marxism. And I would argue people like Ruth Gilmore's work, which talks about life-affirming infrastructures or life-affirming societies or life-affirming economies. People like um, uh, Fazana Khan from Healing Justice London talk about life-affirming societies. What does a life-affirming society or an economy really mean? It means, firstly, the expansion of our theory of life, not just from human, but the non-human systems and even machine systems. What does it mean to be life or becoming orientated? It means that we talk about a developmental approach rather than a control orientated approach in the world. We've constructed a theory of the world which is based on control. Control and punishment. That is our means of organizing the world. What does it mean when we acknowledge the life of everything around us and take a developmental approach? That's a completely different economic paradigm, Mark. I'm really trying to pick into your economic paradigm. There is an alternative economic paradigm available to us in really radical formats. And that radicality is root level reconception of our theory of property, our theory of ourselves and labor, and our theory of life around us. And that is an alternative to this capital, capital versus Marxism theory. I don't think they're dead ends. And I'm going to have to, yeah. sorry, we can't do a back and forth about politics right now, but let me just take, let me just take a couple more points. I know you, you've been waiting for a while, Antoinette, and, and the gentleman behind you. Antoinette, could I take your point? Um, yeah, my point was just, I, I remember finally, it was just around, um, education sort of strand of this uh, I was hoping okay. yeah great yeah and um, I would say that you need to be in the mud to find the truffles so for me within architectural education we actually need to produce more architects and less performance artists or theorists or historians I think we Keep should going. actually really empower the students who come through architecture school to utilize the skills that they have and not just tailor the, the education towards joining a firm, but actually creating your own job, and therefore you have the, the agency uh, to build, not build, build better, etc. So, Thank you. Thanks, Antoinette. Did you still want to contribute? Yeah, um, I want just to, um, to talk about a little bit the, the mood of this uh, uh, debate. I think. Uh, if we put uh, all the things that you are putting in this kind of uh, objective way, you know, like everything is like this, and, and I don't believe this is going to make a very good. Uh, uh, you're not going to convince anyone in this way, in, in my opinion. And uh, I think, like, I was thinking I was an extreme left, but now I think I'm in the center. Because, like, uh, you know, like putting everything is like a doomsday and everything. I don't think for the student that we want like helps to create a debate. I don't think putting something like should be stop building make any sense. Um, I think we, we for sure need to find a solution, but I don't think we have it. Uh, I would just say yeah, I think like sure and, and also all this uh, solution that come always from people that like me. I believe also the other guy, like when I was an architect, I do. Like, let's let them find the solution. Like, I, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, it's, uh, it's very helpful to, to talk this way at this point. Okay. Um, I think, what can I say? We're, we are kind of at time. Andrew, can you make it very, very short, the response? Yeah, yeah. We have pretty much one minute. I actually think it's fitting that we end on a note of, like, you know, perhaps a little bit of tension. We were never here to come up with perfect solutions. And of course, it's a straw man question, right? It's meant to be um, 
debated. That's the point of having us all in the room. And we may have strong positions that will not move on it, but I think the conversations and the perspectives that have um, emerged this evening have been really enriching. I'm really glad that the debate is recorded, um, despite all the colorful language. Um, but I will pass over to Tom, perhaps, to close the event from the perspective of ACAN. Um, can I, uh, can I just ask that all people who want to continue conversing, please join us in the student bar afterwards. There are many clarifications and things to come back to, but just in the interests of time hygiene, Andre, um, I'm going to pass to Tom to, to close, if that's OK. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, um, I actually just wanted to um, offer the speakers, like, if you've got a two-word response to, to what I'm about to ask, because my understanding of Charlotte's original provocation is that um, you can see it as a tactical device, right? That it's a provocative thing that opens the space for us to think differently about the world and how we're acting within it. So, you know, Indy talk, talks about this very different way of operating that's completely different to where we are right now. Um, which calling for a moratorium would be a useful tactical device in the US. Uh, do you want to ask the room or just the speakers for now? Um, maybe it's just a, a just, the, yeah. just the speakers for now. Okay, of course, that would be the point. Is there a yes or no question? Um, you can respond however you like, but yeah, is is um, is it tactically useful to um, to speak to moratorium construction? I would say no. <laughs> no, could say. I was going to say yes because I think that gives us the room to breathe and to prepare for the next steps because I think we can a lot of people can agree that stopping is a solution that is on the table, but we're very unprepared for what that reality might look like. So I think okay. a moratorium will offer us the space to breathe okay. and figure it out. So that's a yes. Audrey? <laughs> yes and no. Okay, that's three words. Technically, indeed, do, do I need to, shall we? Yes? Uh, I don't think it's tactical. I think it's commensurate and thereby necessary. Uh, fair enough. Jay, what about you? If, if your question is to get to the new economic paradigm that Indy mentioned, then potentially. So I might have moved in, because that's what I thought your original question was, because if, if, you, if you want to change an economic structure, you do need to break it. But if you're working within the structure that we have, whether it will work or not is a, is a question. And just before you all start, you know, getting up and putting your coats on, and uh, again, thanks for your patience on this. Can I ask for another show of hands? Who now believes on, thank you, internet, <laughs> different show of hands. Who now believes in, um, should there be a moratorium on new build construction? Who's convinced? Can you put your hands up if you think, yes, there should be a moratorium? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you think, no, there should not be a moratorium? Actually, on reflection of what I've heard, I think you've won a few. Um, and who is as yet still undecided? All right, time's ticking. All right, well, I'll see you in the bar, and thank you very much again.